Yeah. Oh, wait, let me just move this guy. Okay. So we're very happy to have uh, Josh Foster here from uh, MIT. There we go. Uh, all right. He's going to tell us uh, about some nice physics uh, using uh, computational methods to simulate some axion physics and some uh, initial gravitational waves from early matter domination. Yeah, neat. Okay. Well, you know, thanks for the introduction, David. And um, so, most of I know a lot of you, so uh, it should be easy to introduce myself, but I maybe just want to say, like, sort of broadly, uh, one of the things that I'm interested and excited about is uh, the more we look to astrophysics and cosmology to, for signals of new physics, like the more we found ourselves considering systems that are sort of uh, intrinsically nonlinear or non-perturbative, and that's a big part of why they're interesting, but it's also uh, making them hard to model. And so something that I'm interested in is applying large-scale computing uh, to what I think are some pretty interesting and motivated models for how new physics might appear to us. And so uh, you know, I'm going to try to split the difference and tell you about two things. We'll see how well that goes. Um, the first one is sort of the, some meat and potatoes, uh, some work I've been doing for a few years now with collaborators. Uh, Josh Benabu, who's a graduate student at uh, Berkeley, uh, Malta Bushman, who was uh, at Princeton and is now at Amsterdam, and uh, Ben Safdie at, at Berkeley as well, uh, simulating uh, topological defects uh, typically associated with the, uh, the axion field, but no reason to think that you just have to do it with axions. And I also want to tell you about some more recent work I've been doing uh, with, with Jesse Shelton, uh, Mika Fernandez, and uh, Ben Willard, looking at uh, production mechanisms in the early universe for gravitational waves. So, um, okay, so I, I, I always have like uh, a what is an axion top, uh, slide, but like show of hands, is anyone going to be deeply offended if I introduce an axion? No one's going to be offended, that's great. I've had people offended, it's like I was talking down to them, like sorry. I... Cool, okay, so let's, let's imagine you did a very dumb, a very simple thing. You said, uh, what if I took a neutron and I put it in an electric field? Uh, what would happen? Like the, the first answer you might give me is that nothing will happen. And that's not a very good answer because the only thing you told me about is the electric monopole of the neutron. And when you told me nothing would happen, what you really told me is that you can do two thirds minus one third minus one third and come out with zero at the end. So yes, the neutron has no electric charge. It's not going to go flying off if I put it in an electric field. On the other hand, I could, uh, I could ask, will it do anything else interesting? And, and sort of the next interesting thing it could do uh, would be process. So if you imagine that you had some uh, non-trivial charge distribution uh, associated with this up quark and, and the two down quarks, uh, your neutron might wobble. And so that's, in a, that's a classical statement. We can, we can frame this in a more quantum manner, but uh, really there's no need to. We could just go and do that experiment first. And if we go and do that experiment, we're going to find essentially that the neutron does not wobble, uh, at least to within our, our ability to detect those wobbles. If you did ask, what does it mean, sort of in, a, in the context of the standard model, to have a neutron electric dipole moment or to not have a neutron electric dipole moment? Really, what you would be asking is, do I have a term that looks like this? So theta bar, this is sort of an angular parameter. And then GG dual, this is the uh, QCD field strength tensor contracted into its anti-symmetric dual. Uh, so you could ask, so asking if the neutron has an electric dipole moment is really asking, uh, does that term appear in the standard model? And so when we go and we measure no neutron electric dipole moment, really, what we're really doing is we're setting a constraint on what the value of theta bar is. This theta bar is a, sort of an angle, lives between zero and two pi. And so I can do a calculation, or maybe rather Witten can do a calculation, uh, where we find what the value of the neutron electric dipole moment is in terms of that theta bar parameter. We find it's tiny, but not so tiny that it's unreachable. And our constraints on no uh, precession end up meaning a constraint on theta bar being less than one part in 10 to the 10. So that's an astoundingly small number for something that I just told you could be living between zero and two pi. And uh, well, it's a little bit hard to be statistical uh, about uh, physics parameters, but if I was really agnostic and I tried to say maybe I have a uniform fire and it lives between zero and two pi, one in 10 to the 10 is, uh, well, that's more than five sigma unlikely. So maybe I should be worried that I'm missing some, uh, some physics. And if you believe that you're missing some dynamics, that there's actually a reason that the theta bar you measured was zero rather than just uh, the universe picking it out for you, uh, you would be Petchy and Quinn. Uh, so what you would do is you would say theta bar, well, I was stuck with whatever value I got, 
because uh, that was just a parameter. Let's move beyond parameters. Let's talk about dynamical fields. So I'll introduce an axion field that multiplies this GG dual term, much like the theta bar uh, term does. But of course, the axion is dynamical. Uh, it can take a different value than uh, whatever it was set at initially. And in fact, if you go through the exercise of calculating what is the potential that the axion feels as a result of this AGG dual term, it'll look one minus something like 1 minus cosine theta bar plus A over FA. So the first thing we can do is we can identify that the theta bar that we would, or the precession rate that we were measuring with our neutron, that was really measuring some effective theta bar that comes about from the, uh, the linear combination of theta bar and A over FA. But we can also go and evaluate uh, what value is the axion field going to take to minimize the potential, and it's going to take a value of precisely minus theta bar uh, times FA. And so now we have a dynamical solution to the, uh, this, this strong CP problem of why we don't have a neutron electric dipole moment. That gets proposed in 1977, it takes till 1980, or 78 rather, for somebody to say like, should we reckon with that we add a new dynamical content to our universe? Uh, is that compatible with what we go out and we see? Uh, so that was uh, Weinberg and Wilczek in 1978, who point out that uh, that, uh, that new dynamical field they that you've introduced could have some abundance. And uh, maybe that's a, 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 you might think that's a flaw, but that's actually a perk because we know that there's dark matter out there, and so I can account for the dark matter with uh, whatever little fluctuations around the VEV I had in my axion field. So uh, that's awesome, but then we should ask, like, can we detect an axion that is solving the strong CP problem uh, and comprising all of the dark matter? And uh, I don't even have to really give you that last statement before, or to say the answer is essentially no. Uh, so I'm showing you on the x-axis, uh, the sort of a viable mass for an axion or axion-like particle, a measure in dB. On the y-axis, the axion coupling strength to photons. So this is a nice uh, a coupling. We're good at detecting photons. So if an axion is out there and does kind of couple to photons, this is a sort of a promising channel to go look for it through. And so um, all of this white space, this is open, unconstrained space. And uh, this yellow band, uh, this is the relationship between the axion mass and the axion uh, photon coupling strength you expect uh, for a QCD axion. So first off, uh, with the exception of some uh, halo uh, cavity haloscope experiments that have really been going on for like 20 years now, these are long, uh, long running experiments, we're not cutting into this, uh, this yellow band. Uh, but I actually haven't told you anything about um, the, the nature of axion dark matter in this plot. Every constraint essentially uh, that is getting to interesting parameter space is, uh, is assuming actually that all of the, uh, the dark matter is the axion that they happen to be sensitive to. What would be really nice to know if you wanted to go after what you thought was like the most motivated uh, axion mass and uh, coupling, if you are highly motivated by the statement that the axion can solve the strong CP problem and be dark matter, is know what is the precise value of MA and GA gamma gamma associated with uh, such a special QCD uh, axion. So. It would be nice to be able to calculate this. Um, it would be nice just to know, but actually in terms of how we go and look for axions, uh, we're almost entirely prior driven because the parameter space is so, so large. Uh, the sensitivity we have to an axion as a function of time is not very good. So if you operate an experiment uh, and you sit for a time t integration, then your sensitivity to that coupling goes like t integration to the one fourth. So improvements uh, that come from around from waiting, these are hard, hard one. This is why uh, circa uh, 2016, these are the state of the ADMEC cavity heloscope uh, limits. Uh, this is you know 20 years of the experiment operating. You know, they weren't collecting data for that whole time, but the point is it's two decades of effort. Uh, these lighter bands, these are other regions of perimeter space that the collaboration wants to get to, but uh, it is nice to sometimes ask yourself, like, how long would it actually take to, to cover the, all those regions? And we're talking decades more effort. And that's only actually going to higher masses. It's even worse if you want to go to low masses. So uh, sometimes you'll see ADMX projections that, that go to lower masses than what they've gotten to so far. And you should ask, like, what's the amount of time uh, associated with that search? And actually, the amount of time turns out to be like 10,000 years. <laughs> Uh, but, so, so but conversely, if you improve by a factor of 10, yeah, you reduce 10,000 years yeah, to one so year. Definitely, right? Like the, those projections, they are not projecting like we're going to operate the experiment we have. Those are projecting like we're going to make big improvements in our ability to do an experiment. Uh, yeah. So, so first off, things are just like hard one. Uh, but also, when, when we talk about an axion, usually what we do is we talk about making a measurement uh, in frequency space. 
And so then you want to ask, like, how frequency coherent is a signal associated with the axion? The frequency coherence is going to set, be set by the velocity dispersion of, of dark matter in the Milky Way. Turns out to be about one part in 10 to the 6. So if you want to do a really sensitive experiment, like ADMX to do it, you do a, a resonance search. So you say, I want to look for narrow signals. Let's tune my uh, instrument to respond to signals at a really narrow band at a frequency that I just said I wanted to look. So what that means is not only are you looking at many orders of magnitude and mass, but you're only taking steps of one part in 10 to the six at a time in terms of your sensitivity. So this is, this is why it takes so long. Another way of saying this might be that actually, um, if you knew where the, what the axion mass was, it's more or less a high school or maybe an intermediate lab uh, experiment if you wanted to build something that could find it in days or weeks or years or so on. But the really hard part is going over the full range of parameter space. And so uh, it would be nice if we could do some theory that would tell us uh, what is the precise mass that we want to go after. Of course, in the, in the case of WIMPs, we essentially have this, right? We have a theory argument that tells us to look at the GEV to TEV scale, which is why we haven't spent time uh, looking for, for WIMP dark matter at the milli EV scale. We haven't. So it would be nice to have a, a related argument. And so one of the things that we can do is we can go and we can try to understand what are the production mechanisms for axions that are in the universe. So there we need to think about when the axion field is realized, and it turns out our, our scenario has to bifurcate. So one scenario, and one that's going to turn out, unfortunately, to be totally unpredictive, is pre-inflationary misalignment. So the idea here is that you have an axion, uh, you draw whatever initial field value that axion field takes uh, on the horizon, then inflation blows up whatever that horizon is. So you can think of that draw as living between 0 and 2 pi, just like the draw for the beta bar was. And now you can turn the crank in your calculation, and you're going to find that the, uh, the relic abundance of axions is going to look something like ma squared times theta squared, and then this parameter f of theta, this is just supposed to control for whatever like uh, uh, small scale details uh, of the potential related to like anharmonic uh, correction factors might look like. Uh, so of course, because we only had one draw of theta, if you want to motivate really heavy axion masses or, or really light axion masses, you just say, ah, uh, nature picked out a weird initial value for the axion field. So this is not a, a great predictive scenario, and it's, it's one we just sort of have to live with. On the other hand, uh, we can talk about a different uh, scenario, which turns out to be totally predictive, just hard to calculate it. And so that is post-inflationary misalignment. So the idea here is that uh, sometime after inflation, the axion field is realized. And thanks to inflation, the horizon uh, at the time that uh, uh, the axion field is drawn is very, very tiny. It's going to expand, uh, and at some later time, i.e. the present day, there are going to be maybe something like 10 to the 50 horizons corresponding to the horizon size at which the axion field was drawn. So uh, I have 10 to the 50 independent draws of the field. I think I can get pretty good statistical precision on 10 to the 50 draws. Uh, and, and so now I can perform my, my relic abundance calculation. It's going to look something like ma squared times maybe whatever this, some expectation value of theta squared is. But this expectation value is doing a lot of work uh, because now I have an inhomogeneous field. The, the field inhomogeneities are coming, going to come into causal contact with one another and they're going to evolve in some non-trivial way. So really that, that, uh, that angle averaging, that is somehow, uh, not just the, the average value, but also the details of how the axion field relaxes to its present day state. Uh, so I've uh, essentially said that. So let's, uh, let's take a, a really simple uh, sort of phenomenological model for what a realization of the axion field might look like. So I actually need to go to a, a complex scalar. Uh, that's going, so I have my you know, formal complex scalar Lagrangian. I have a quartic self-interaction and then a thermal mass term. So eventually, uh, the, the temperature drops, we're going to have a spontaneous symmetry breaking, my axion is going to get realized as the phase of that complex scalar with the radial mode more or less frozen in. I've also added this extra term over here. So this is something associated with my QCD potential, and I'm just parameterizing the way that the axion, which is initially uh, uh, going to be a massless cold state boson after the spontaneous symmetry breaking, is going to pick up a uh, temperature-dependent mass at the time of the QCD phase transition. And so it's picking up that mass that's actually going to let my axion be the present day dark matter. If I didn't have that, uh, I would be in trouble. So uh, what, uh, what becomes challenging uh, if you wanted to evaluate these, um, he said, all right, let's just uh, you know, throw, throw that, uh, those equations in motion associated with that complex state along the grid, uh, press go, get your answer at late times. You can try, uh, but it turns out to be hard. And the reason that this is hard is because the, uh, the potential that the, the complex scalar field uh, feels supports topological defects. So one of the ways to visualize one of these topological defects called a string is if we imagine that uh, on each little horizon, we've drawn uh, an angle 
uh, for the axion field. Uh, I can have some locations where if I trace out a loop, the, uh, the angle winds from zero back to two pi. Uh, so zero back to two pi. Not only I think that um, my axion has some shift, shift symmetry, it doesn't care whether I add two pi to it or not. But now I have a little bit of a problem because I can keep zooming in on this point. As, zo as I zoom in on this point, I'm continuing to wind around zero and two, two pi, but I've gone to smaller and smaller radii. Uh, while going around the same angular winding, which means my gradients are getting larger. So eventually what I can see is actually that uh, the gradients are going to get so large that I need the, 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 uh, the UV theory, I need the theory uh, not just in the broken phase, but also in the unbroken phase to understand its dynamics. Now, uh, then the challenge enters in that uh, you need to evolve, you need to have in your box, if you did a simulation, both the horizon uh, at the time these defects form, as well as when the axion acquired its mass, but you also need to resolve these very small scale features associated with topological defects. So back in uh, 2019, 2020, there were a few different groups that were trying to do this, uh, and um, modulo what people think is more or less a double counting uh, in one group's work, uh, people were starting to agree that uh, it seemed like the axion mass uh, associated with this post-inflationary scenario uh, was 25 microwave. But uh, those simulations, they had a really uh, sort of abbreviated dynamical range for the reason that they were trying to see the axion realize in a spontaneous symmetry breaking, then see the QCD axion potential turn on, then have all of the def defects collapse, then continue to evolve into a point that the, the field was linear and you could make a relative abundance calculation. So uh, that's a lot to to, to, to squeeze into one simulation. Sorry, so, so that mass, that's what corresponds to axiom being all of the dark matter. Right? All the dark matter, yes. If you yeah. believe this calculation, yeah. which is maybe not the right thing to do anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is not your work, I guess, but or maybe it is. So, but these, that, yeah. that FA does not correspond to Good. 25 so, micro EV. So yes, so um, these, uh, these simulations, these were ones that were done with like tractable parameters rather than realistic yeah. parameters and attempted to extract a scaling argument uh, or a scaling relationship between uh, FA and the, uh, the axion abundance. And so then, yeah, you turn that, that uh, relationship between FA and omega A into a relationship between MA and omega A. And the larger FA is more tractable for simulations because we have um, Good, so this has to do with the, uh, basically the hierarchy you place between when the, uh, when the axions form and um, when the, so, yeah, so this is a maybe, Really, the game you're always playing is how much can I abbreviate the, the hierarchy between the, uh, the QCD phase transition and the PQ phase transition. And so I think the right way to, to understand this is um, the, uh, the, you're pushing the, um, the QCD phase transition to a uh, fixed hierarchy. I think in those simulations, it's typically about 10th whatever the PQ uh, phase transition was. Uh, and then for that fixed hierarchy, you're, you're evaluating FA, which really, I guess, has to do with the difference between when the phase transition, the PQ phase transition happens as compared to when modes at the uh, PQ scale enter the horizon. Yes, good, sorry. So it's a, um, it's, it's the, the relative hierarchy between the horizon size and the, uh, the defect size. Are you gonna talk about what sets the error bars? Like, they're not really that small, right? They include systematic. Yeah, yeah, good. So, um, what sets the air bars? I mean, like air bar. Whenever I show air bars, you probably need to like take down an enormous grain of salt <laughs> because like these these came from like uh, five simulations, and so you can take the variance over five simulations, but maybe you don't. Ah, uh, that's what that is. That's, that's the, the that's that's, that's the, the So these small one, these small air bars, are the variance over the five simulations. Okay. Then these red air bars. These are basically saying actually those five simulations, like the the um, the difference that in the results that we see, does not seem to be well accounted for. Um, if I look at the essentially the the scaling from this value of FA to that value of FA, does not seem to be accounted for by just the um, the, the variance that I computed over those individual simulations. And so let's add a a nuisance uncertainty and just uh, fit the nuisance uncertainty at the same time we we fit the data. So it's a little bit um, ad hoc, yeah. Uh, I thought there are also some uncertainties related to MA of T, right? The time dependence of that. Yeah, so there is, a, there is so some uncertainty associated with the time dependence. On the other the hand, um, it doesn't matter too much. And the reason is, uh, so first off, um, Hubble is decreasing relatively quickly. So you want to compare um, Hubble with, uh, with MA. Those are the two scales of the problem. And 
so Hubble is decreasing fairly quickly as a function of temperature, and the axion mass is increasing fairly quickly as a function of temperature. And so these go the you know the opposite direction. And so the uncertainties that you have is like is M A scaling like um, it's scaling like one over t cubed or one over t to the fourth, but it, it means that like the, the the duration of the transient where interesting things are actually happening in your field only gets like a little bit uh, smaller. So um, yeah, there's a, there's a, a group that's looked into this, but it doesn't uh, seem to make a particularly large uh, impact on the results. Yeah. Sorry, Jeff, I didn't quite get what you were saying about the hierarchy between FA and the horizon size, because as you're saying, like the horizon size where MA and H cross, mm -hmm. like that, that's always roughly going to happen at lambda QCD, right? Yeah, good. But, but so, FA you're making yeah, higher yeah, yeah, here, yeah. so enabling yeah. the hierarchy is becoming even larger. So this is yeah, good. So this is this is what I was saying. Where um, what you've done is you you've taken the the QCD scale and you yeah. just like artificially moved it up like okay. that that okay. You, to the sure. near the PP and scale. Then and you just have FA to do that. And then this sure. FA, uh, this really what you want to do is you want to say when are modes. Um, Entering the when are PQ scale modes entering the horizon? Uh, so there you're essentially calculating what's the hierarchy between FA and M Planck. Sure. sure. Um, okay. Yeah. Yep. Otherwise, I mean, like you could do a simulation at uh, smaller values of FA, but essentially what happens is you spend more and more of your time in a regime where modes have entered the horizon, but you haven't gone through the uh, phase transition. And so, to the degree that you believe that you can understand what happens for a, a, a free scalar field, like maybe these. These, uh, these things aren't that interesting, and so maybe the, the the thing you worry about is not like how close FA is to M Planck, but actually like how close lambda QCD is to, to FA. So um, I can do a little bit of budgeting, and so if I do some budgeting, I can ask like what are the biggest simulations I could have done in the first place, and so if I'm like totally shameless, what I would say is that I need to have at least one lattice site uh, resolving the size of the topological defects. So the size of the topological defects is essentially the inverse uh, radio mass. And uh, so I can say this, I need, as a resolution criteria, I need this delta x times mr to be less than 1. On the other hand, I also need to have multiple horizons in my box. One of the ways that you can see this is if I have a top, like a, a spatially extended topological defect in my box, and my box is smaller than the horizon, it's in causal contact with itself, and so you get funny features. So for example, if you have a box that's smaller than the horizon, you can get a, a domain wall that forms across the entire box, uh, and then there's no reason for that domain wall to ever collapse. So that's, a, that's not the scenario of our universe, and it's one that we should avoid uh, in the case of our simulations as well. So you can turn the crank, and you can say, uh, these are the, the constraints that I have to satisfy. Uh, let's say I can do a, a, good, a, a nice big lattice, I can do 5,000 cubed lattice sites, then you're going to find out that about the, the, the biggest hierarchy that you can get to between the horizon size, the radial load mass is nicely encapsulated by this parameter, log mr over h, you get to about 8. Why is log mr over h a nice parameter to use? Well, it's both a, a, a sort of a temporal coordinate because Hubble is changing as a function of time. It's getting smaller, so larger values of this log are, I mean, later and later times. But also, so that the string tension, the energy density per unit string length, is evolving. Uh, it, ha it has a logarithmic correction that looks like log mr over h. And, uh, and so this tells you that actually like something is dynamically changing in your simulation as you go to later and later times. It's the energy density associated with the strings. And so uh, if you ex maybe you actually don't expect your system to be totally scale invariant uh, because there is this logarithmic evolution uh, in parts of the system that do matter, the string tension. Uh, another question you could ask is like, what's a realistic value of log mr over h? So if it, like you took that 25 micro EV axion mass prediction, you turned that into an FA, and then you out calculated this log mr over h parameter of the QCD phase transition, that would turn out to be like log of 60, log equals 65. Uh, so you're off in terms of what you can simulate, you're off by about a factor of 10 uh, in this log. So uh, it's worth being concerned that maybe you've missed some effects. And so um, one effect is just how does the string length per, uh, per horizon evolve? So there's, there was a group, uh, Giovanni Villadoro, Marco Gorghetto, and Hardy, back in 2018, who started to look at this. And so what they were doing is they were doing simulations that only had strings. They had no QCD potential. Uh, so they removed one of the scales from their problem and then let them purely focus on the string dynamics. They go up to log of 7.5 uh, with what they call a physical string, which is to say a string that doesn't have an artificially grow, uh, shrinking tension associated with it. And uh, what they find is that more or less independent of the initial conditions that they gave their, their field, that it seemed like the system was evolving into some attractor solution where the string length uh, measured in 
the Hubble length per Hubble volume uh, is growing uh, something like log of MR over H. And so this matters because that means essentially as a function of time, you're getting more strings. Strings can radiate off, of, off axions. And so more strings can more, radiate off more axions. And if you've not accounted for that in sort of truncated range, dynamical range simulations you've done, you've underestimated the potential axion number density and uh, then maybe gotten the wrong relic abundance mass. Another thing you could ask is what is the spectrum of, of axions that are radiated by strings? If you ask that, uh, you could essentially ask uh, uh, down here, the, the Q is sort of some spectral index fit to the emission spectrum. Uh, down here, Q less than one, this is radiated into the UV, which is saying you're not radiating off many axions uh, because the axions that you're radiating off are very energetic. On the other hand, if your Q goes to larger than one, you're radiating to the IR, in which case you're radiating off a large number of axions, which is sort of allowed for energy conservation because those axions you radiated off don't have much energy. So this really uh, can qualitatively change the story because what you care ultimately about for the abundance calculation is the number density and then the mass that they acquire at late times. So here I'm showing you the prediction as a function of log MR over H, uh, how the axion number density produced by string emission is a, uh, varies for different choices of Q. And what we can compare that to is the sort of the misal effective misalignment contribution associated with a 25 micro EV axion. So, that, uh, so first off, my, uh, my misalignment contribution number density, uh, it looks like what's shown in dashed black. You can compare that to for small, uh, small value of Q rated into the UV. This doesn't uh, matter. It doesn't change your abundance calculation uh, beyond maybe 10% or less corrections. On the other hand, if you have a, 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 um, uh, even a scale invariant emission, uh, the, the string emission is going to overproduce relative to the uh, sort of the, the default misalignment. Contribution. And as you go to even larger uh, values of Q, this can be an order of magnitude or more correction. Uh, is there an upper limit on how many actions can this radiate? Yeah, so the upper limit is going to get set by uh, a badge. You take all of the strings, which is going to be parameterized by the string length parameter, and you say what happens if they all went into, uh, into the lowest energy uh, possible axions that can radiate. That lowest energy, that's essentially going to be set by the wave number corresponding to the string string spacing. Uh, so um, you can you can do that. Uh, on the other hand, we actually know how the string length is evolving because we also see that uh, evolving with log uh, mr over h. And so you can do a sort of a self-consistent calculation where you say the string length is evolving as log mr over h. I can turn that into a statement about how the physical length of string uh, is changing. So how the energy total energy available in strings is changing, and then how many axions get radiated off. Yeah. Josh, in this plot, what are you assuming for this like, C parameter? This the C parameter. Oh, good. So for the C parameter here, I'm just assuming one. One. Yep. Okay. Yep. So then there's another factor. Well, so the colored another, lines can boost can be boosted by yes. another factor of the log. They can get boosted by a square root of the log. Um, the square root is coming from okay. So the more strings emit more, but then you change that IR cutoff. Uh, so if you have more strings densely packed together, you uh, radiate into the IR. You have a higher IR cutoff, and so that's less number density that's produced. Yeah. Um, so that's a, that 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 uh, good. If you extrapolate the the string length growth to log equals seventy, that looks like you should get to a string length parameter of C of about fifteen. So that would be a, a factor of four rescaling, but that's certainly a, a, a smaller effect than this uh, Q. Yeah. So. Um, the simulations that were done before, they were all done on static lattices, which is to say like what you would do if you were doing your first simulation. You'd say, I have a grid, I have points living on my grid. Now I will code up whatever numerical approximation I want, like a Laplacian and a numerical integrator. I'll press go and, and see what I get. But the whole problem is that we had to hold uh, many horizon volumes in memory. So we had to have a, a volumetrically large grid, but we also needed good spatial resolution at the location of the defects. Now, um, you can do this with a static lattice, but that means you have really high resolution everywhere. Uh, there are not defects in most places. Defects are about one per horizon. And so, and they're also, in the case of strings, a, a 1D object. So you're horrendously over-resolving this 3D volume because you insisted on using a, a, a uniform resolution across your box. What you can do instead uh, is you can do something called adaptive mesh refinement. So adaptive mesh refinement, the idea is I have a coarse level. And when I see that I start to need uh, better and better resolution uh, based on a tagging criteria, uh, I say, let's add more resolution. I up-resolve the grid in that particular location by adding level one. 
but then nothing's stopping me. So that's a that buys me a factor of two in resolution. Nothing's stopping me uh, at level one. I can add uh, level two and level three and so on. So ultimately, we do simulations that get to uh, level six, starting at eight thousand cubed uh, lattice sites. So if you you can turn that around. You can ask, like, what would a static lat a, a uniform lattice look like? It could be about two hundred fifty thousand cubed uh, lattice sites, which uh, there is not a computing cluster in the world to fit that into memory, let alone one where they would give you enough time to advance that a single step. Um, so let me just like show you pretty pictures. So um, you're seeing a few things. First, the, the blue lines; those are the actual strings. Uh, yellow, the yellow glow around them. That's uh, energy density in the radial mode. The, uh, the, the gray around it, that's uh, energy density in axions. So that's the thing that you actually want to go out and calculate the emission spectrum associated with. And uh, then there are these boxes. So the um, red box, that is refinement at the first level. And then there are yellow boxes living inside the red boxes. So that's refinement at the second level. And so one of the things that you can notice is first off, they just uh, they follow the, uh, the strings. We have a, essentially a tagging criteria based on a local truncation error test that just dynamically says like, hey, if you don't have better resolution there, uh, you're going to have a problem. And so uh, strings are small scale features. The code correctly rec recognizes that you need good resolution there. But you can also notice uh, down here, there's you know some violent process going on where some strings intersected or whipped around. And while there aren't strings there anymore, there are still boxes. And that's just because you have a high wave number emission in the, the radial mode and the axion mode that you still need to up resolve uh, in order to maintain the resolution of. OK, so the first thing we can do is we can go, we can do, well, we did two simulations, one that got to log 9 and one that got to log 10. You might ask, why did you only get uh, to log 9 or log 10? You told me that the, a, a static lattice could get to log 8, and you seem to be much, much better resolved than uh, a static lattice. Well, the answer is actually like our, our local truncation error uh, tells us that we need a better resolution than just one uh, lattice site per string core. Uh, our, our local truncation error, uh, uh, if we do that, is, is order 1. Uh, so that actually tells you that there are like order one per step errors associated with the simulations that are, are done with that relatively weak resolution criteria. So we're actually resolving strings eight times better and then also doing uh, larger volumes. So that's why we get up to log 10. I would have actually really liked if you could get away with the weaker, weaker resolution criteria. I mean, then we could have gotten to like log 14 or something. Uh, it would have been a nicer number. But one of the things we can do is we can go and we can look at what's the string length parameter uh, as a function of time. And so we confirm what is more or less a uh, growth that is linear in this term log mr over h. And uh, I think one of the things that's important to remember here is like you're doing these simulations, but like more and Moore's law is awesome, but you're also competing with the log of the quantity. And so Moore's law is not going to get you all the way to log mr over h equals 70. So you need to be, uh, you need to have in the back of your head that you do the best simulations you can do, and then you calibrate some theory understanding. And so what I'm showing you here, uh, there are predictions from a, a sort of an effective model for string dynamics called the velocity one scale model. And uh, predictions made within the velocity one scale model are that uh, once your string length parameter gets to about 1.2, uh, that uh, essentially it should saturate and stop growing. And um, well, one simulation got to 1.2. Uh, a simulation that went a little longer got past 1.2. So uh, that does not seem to be the case. Although, of course, it would be nice to do more and more simulations and make that a stronger statement. We can calculate the energy density, and we can go get an emission spectrum. Uh, and then we can do a fit to that uh, emission spectrum. We did this. Yes. I wasn't sure how to take the sign of that statement. So are you saying that the simulations are not Right, and thus, we no, should, oh, or are you okay. saying that the so I, one scale prediction is not right? I think the one, the one scale prediction is not right. And so the reason I think the one scale prediction is not right is the one scale prediction comes from writing down this model, doing small simulations of strings that end up maybe log equals seven, fitting in parameters of that model, and then extrapolating. And so if you did this and you stopped at log equals seven, it's because like you think you're running out of dynamical range and resolution at log equals seven. So in some sense, it's like totally unsurprising to me that the velocity one scale model predicts weird behavior, such as a, a saturating string length, just a little bit after log equals seven. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think that was a trustworthy prediction. Uh, I think it would be nice to think about how to do that better. At the very least, I think we can, uh, I, I feel fairly certain that that is not so, the right. So you think the string length will, will never saturate, they'll just keep growing? I don't know. Um, I don't know, but I think, uh, I mean, it's possible, right? Like for some parameters of that velocity one scale model, it does 
saturated. I don't trust the parameters that have been estimated from other simulations and went into those, uh, those predictions. But I, I, I think uh, you should try to make the velocity one scale model work and it would be, yeah. Well, but I, th I, so I thought that the sort of like premise to this slide here was yeah. your statement was like, well, you can only do a certain amount of simulation. So you want to have some sort of yeah. models that you can then match your simulations onto that not allow you to continue into ranges that you're not able to simulate. Yes. yes. And so the, you said this is one model and now you're telling us, well, that model is wrong. So is the statement then that you don't have any models that you can then the match onto that allow you to extend into additional ranges? Yeah, I think that's the, the good. So I don't know if the problem with this model is the model, uh, like the model framework or the particular parameters that went into it. Uh, these, I mean, you fit these by doing many simulations and varying over them, and I've shown you I'm able to do two simulations, so I'm not really able to, to reproduce those model fits. Um, so yeah, I don't know if there if there's a problem with the velocity one scale model or not. I think there's certainly a pro there's likely a problem with the parameters that go into it. Uh, yes, people should still try the velocity one scale model is really the only one that I know of that people have tried to use make uh, use to make predictions. But if there's other models out there, you should try to make that work as well. So yeah. Right now, this is what we've got. This is what we've got. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me get on the same data. So this MR parameter, mm -hmm. what is really the physics? Is it the tension of a string which matters here, or it's really this radial modes produced? What, 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 what dependence on MR is coming from? Yeah, good. So I think um, this, yeah, it, it becomes a little bit hard to see because uh, it is both the string tension and it is also the time coordinate. So uh, now, other people have done simulations where what they do is they get rid of the time dependence of the string tension. Uh, so that this log MR over H, this is purely a temporal coordinate instead of one that also describes the string energy density. They, in, in those simulations, uh, which are actually under better control because they, they don't run into the same uh, resolution limits, uh, still there is a logarithmic evolution of uh, the string length parameter. So this seems to be a feature uh, not of just the string tension, uh, but actually the way you just, if you have some number density of strings in a volume, they, uh, they interact and interconnect, form smaller loops, those loops continue to evolve. So, but I guess what I'm going to ask, yeah. like you write it dependence on M MR, but what is really the physical parameter which stands here? Is it important it's, for you that there are physical particles with that mass? Or oh, it's really good, just good. It's no, really good. tension? This is, this, is, this, is, this is both string tension and this is also time since the strings formed. Yeah, that's the, the so it's really the tension here, right? Or, or I, I think it's the time. I think it's the, it's the, the time because the time and string forming. Yeah, yeah. But you do have in your simulation, you do have also physical radial particles, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're being produced as you. They are, and 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 so we can actually go and look at the the radial mode emission. The radial mode emission does not seem to be a, a, a significant factor at any point in time during our, our simulations, which is maybe sensible. These these radial modes are heavy, and the axial modes. Or not. Um, the strings are typically semi-relativistic. Maybe that's a, a useful data point to provide. They move with, at about a speed of you know, maybe a third or a half. And so uh, it's typically not so much that you're efficiently producing uh, radial modes from string dynamics. But kings generically form kings, right? And yeah, so you did, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that you can actually see that in the in this um, simulation when there when there is a sorry. The, this is a zoom thing, not, a, not our, our animation is smooth. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can see that like there was an interconnection, and during that interconnection process, uh, you did get a reasonable amount of, of radio emission. But that's still it's still a, 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 it's still small. Yeah. It's like one of our logs. Yeah. And so I, I think in our in our simulations, we tried to measure this at one point, and it's like a, a percent level amount of the total emission. So, because you know, where I was heading to, yeah. so if that emission is important, because one can imagine that there are some other particles coupled to a string, right, which could mass not necessarily set by MR or some yeah. fermions, which can also be emitted. Yeah, 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 yeah. So no, I don't mean to make this sound like the, the end of the story. This is just sort of maybe the, the simplest scenario that you could imagine, um, where you, yeah, you only have the axiom of the radio mode. Okay, so um, we can also try to extract that emission spectrum just by looking at the energy density in the axion field as a function of time, taking numerical derivatives. Uh, we can go and we can do a fit. Uh, so here I'm showing you the fit to the emission spectrum at about uh, log equals nine and a half. Uh, 
you get a value of Q, that Q is about one, more or less corresponding to a scale invariant spectrum. And so these are the, the best fit values of Q uh, as a function of log that we get from our new simulation that goes out to log each time. And so um, like, uh, you know, like our simulation that went out to log equals nine, we're not really seeing any strong evidence uh, for a, a logarithmically evolving uh, Q, although we have error bars that uh, one, we would like to beat down with just more uh, simulations, but it's also true that probably there, there are systematics uh, associated with our analysis that um, uh, we can do a better job treating just at the level of signal processing. I mean, this is a kind of a big data problem where you have uh, 250,000 cubed lattice sites and you need some sensible way of, of handling all of them. Uh, so if you essentially downsample or maybe work at the coarsest level of resolution, uh, well, aliasing of high frequency features down to low frequency noise is certainly an effect that happens. And one that we need, would like to get under better control, it's possible that there's better precision living in these simulations right now than we've been able to extract thus far. Uh, now, one of the things that you want to do ultimately is you want to use a, a calculation of the emission of axions from strings, and then you want to extrapolate, you want to integrate over all the time between string formation and the QCD phase transition, make a prediction for how much total axions get emitted, and then how that axion abundance evolves the nonlinear QCD phase transition. So this is something we've developed a formalism for, but we can actually also go, and if that formalism is not particularly uh, fancy, it's more or less assuming uh, uh, number density conservation with some small corrections uh, coming from the nonlinearity of QCD potential. We can go check that. So what we've done is we've taken our um, our, uh, our simulation that went out to log equals nine and said, okay, instead of just continuously going out to log equals nine with no QCD potential turning on, let's turn on the QCD potential at log equals seven. Then what we can do is we can measure the axion abundance in the simulation when it ends at log equals nine, but after having gone through the QCD phase transition. And we can compare that to the axion abundance that we would have calculated in the self-consistent way, just looking at the emission uh, from the, the string only simulation that went out to log equals nine. So here's another animation, and so you can see the strings evolving, but now you can see domain walls forming in between them uh, before the domain wall tension contracts the network down and it collapses. And uh, so the blue is high energy density regions, red is low energy density regions in the axion field, and uh, you can actually see little oscillons there, so uh, semi-relativistic bound uh, uh, field configurations. So we can, um, we can go, we can do a, a, a mass calculation uh, associated with whatever this late time field configuration is. And uh, the number is not particularly meaningful because uh, these, both these simulations, uh, the one that went, ended at log equals nine with no QCD phase transition, and the one that ended at log equals seven with a QCD phase transition, neither of these are the, the realistic value of the log. But we can do a, a calculation that we at least hope is consistent between the sim two simulations. And they both predict an axion mass of about um, uh, 15 microwave. Uh, so they agree with each other at the 10% level, which is a nice cross-check, and gives us a little bit more faith that this uh, axion mass prediction that we're ultimately making from our, our largest log equals 10 simulation, which corresponds now to a mass of about 70 micro uh, it, it is correct in the sense that at least we are taking information from our simulation and propagating it down to the QCD transition at the late, at the late times. Um, so yeah, if you ask, uh, where does that mass prediction live as compared to where we've looked for axions uh, so far? It's this light red band. You should compare that to the, uh, the dark red bands that correspond to the, the cavity halo scope experiments. And you see that there's more or less uh, no overlap. Um, so this actually makes me uh, very much hope that future experiments like MathMax or the plasma halo scope or others that are going to sort of get to masses beyond uh, Haystack, which is sort of previously what we might have called the, the, the frontier for high mass detection, uh, those, those experiments will, will probe uh, precisely this parameter range. So, yes? You still have a somewhat wide error bar, or is that just from like running the simulation many times? Yeah, so the error bar it comes from, no, because we, I mean, we've done two simulations, so we run the simulation twice. Um, the error bar comes from uh, essentially the systematic uncertainties that we have in reconstructing Q, then propagated into uh, our late time abundance calculation. Okay. Sure. Uh, for, for this particular mass, you, so for this prediction, you assume like C goes as log C. all the way up to what's C 70? What's C? C oh, excuse me, the stream yeah. perfect. Yeah, no, no. Oh, oh. Okay. Um, yeah, good. So we are, we've fitted a logarithmic growth to the string, uh, to, the, to C. We've also 
well, we attempted to fit a logarithmic growth to the Q. We didn't find a logarithmic uh, growth to Q. Uh, and so we just assumed a constant one that more or less varies uh, up to one sigma between uh, one plus or minus 0.03. That's for the Q. That's for the Q. Yep. And then there's a, there is a, a fit for C, and we didn't, uh, I, I've not included the air bars on C for that, but those air bars are much smaller than the air bars, or the, the air bars that propagate it through from the uncertainty on C are much smaller than the air bars that propagate through from the uncertainty on Q. So it wouldn't meaningfully change this prediction. Now, if you could, but that's because our C is going to, it's going from one to 17. Uh, not that big of a change. Now, if you had a way of making C go to like 10 to the nine, like then we'd be talking, right? Like that could, that could change the story a lot. So the difference between this 15 and 25, you put it before that due to this log, log, log evolution? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, this is why I've tried to be circumspect about what they, <laughs> the numbers actually are. So that, that 25, that comes from doing uh, a simulation that has essentially a horrendous dynamical range and separation between uh, PQ and, and QCD scales. Um, they were simulated at tractable PQ scales for that tractable hierarchy and then extrapolated. Uh, these new these, these new simulations, the one that, that says something about that, that say log seventy, these come from never putting in a, uh, a QCD phase transition, just measuring um, the Q over the range of logs where you can actually simulate. Uh, but then there's no unphysical hierarchy, uh, so you you make a, a, a calculation of the relative abundance from the indices that you've extracted from that simulation. You get a prediction for about seventy micro. The 15 microwave, this comes from running the simulation out to log equals nine with and without the QCD potential. Then uh, associating, like you have in that simulation, a particular hierarchy between um, the PQ and the QCD scales. And uh, now you can, so you can say, what is the axion mass that has that particular scaling, uh, that particular hierarchy between MA and PQ? Uh, as I change that value, let's say, of, uh, of uh, FA. Uh, so it's a little bit of a convoluted calculation. I, 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 uh, I'd be happy to go over it with you on the board, but I, I'm not sure I can do it justice in words. As compared to what Giovanni had? So yeah, so what Giovanni to... had, so the, the 70 microwave prediction that, that we have is most comparable to the prediction uh, that Giovanni and company make. Okay. Yeah, where they're living. So you uh, basically agree with them, right? So you Well, uh, they, they'll fight us about it. I mean, it's about a factor of 10 difference. And um, they're predicting 500 microwave and higher. Because of their Q. Because their, their Q grows. Their Q, they, 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 so good. If they took the Q that they saw in the simulation and just said the largest value we saw is 0.9, uh, let's make a calculation for 0.9, then they would get something that essentially agrees with us. But uh, they, in their simulations, they're seeing a logarithmic evolution of Q that they extrapolate out to large values of Q, meaning you have lots of emission into the IR, and then that ch uh, changes the, uh, the relative abundance calculation in a meaningful way. And so they, uh, they turn the crank and they get about a 500 micro I see. And you are saying we don't We're saying that we don't see the logarithmic evolution of Q. And is it clear why they're seeing it? So, yeah, good. So, so this is the, it's their resolution criteria. That's the one lattice per string core. Um, that's, that's what their, their sim, simulations use. And uh, I think that's probably just not good enough to uh, actually resolve the, the dynamics of these strings. I mean, you're, you're so especially one of, the, one of the ways to see this is, so when you're in these, um, you're doing these simulations, you're doing them in co-moving coordinates. So uh, your, the physical scale associated with your lattice site is, uh, is, is, is growing. So you're getting worse and worse at resolving the, uh, the large uh, wavelength modes in your box. And so if you were, if, you, if your strings wanted to emit into the UV, uh, you're going to have uh, numerical error emitting into the UV that gets worse and worse as your simulation goes later and later. And so I think this is a way to see that there's like a time dependent resolution effect just associated with having a pretty weak resolution criteria and uh, running for as long as you can and trying to fit some time evolution. I think that's actually one of the nice things about doing this AMR approach, which is that you can just keep the strings at fixed resolution uh, every time. So, so for us, uh, the most resolved the string ever is, is eight lattice sites, and the least resolved it ever is is four, because once it gets to four lattice sites, we, uh, we say you better up resolve to eight lattice sites. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's a, a particularly good feature of this uh, approach. 
Yeah. Forgive me if I don't remember this correctly, but I think like way down in temperatures as you approach lambda QCD, mm -hmm. uh, you can still have sort of non-trivial effects on the string dynamics. Like when you get close to, I think it's some Masonic masses or something, then you can effectively have the strings freeze for a little bit in your simulate. I mean, if you were to simulate all that that far down, right? But yeah. So you so 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 you want essentially add a, a friction to the, exactly, the evolution. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So if you have a friction as a, uh, associated with the evolution of these strings, it matters one how big that friction is, and then two how long that friction sticks around. But that is a way of realizing maybe a larger uh, string uh, density parameter C uh, that that could uh, affect your your calculation. So good. Not only do you care about um, how big that friction was, how long that friction lasted, but then you also care about um, how quickly the, uh, the the system can return to what seems to be like the scaling or track layer solution. Uh, because since what's happening, you're, you're radiating off relativistic modes, the axion is massless. So then red shifting like, uh, like radiation, you're, most of your contribution, 90% uh, of the number density that matters uh, comes from like, the, the Hubble time immediately before the QCD phase transition. So even if at some early time you have some uh, uh, some extra friction that makes the C get large, if by the time you're getting close to the QCD phase transition that you return to the scaling solution, I don't think it would affect this calculation. On the other hand, if you have in mind effects that would give you friction around the time of the QCD phase transition, I certainly think that could happen. Yeah, I, I thought maybe I forget. I think it was Samson who told me a long time ago, but that there's a yeah, you can get some friction like very close to the QCD phase transition from Mason. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is this is another feature that is like worth in, incorporating yeah, in these okay. simulations. But I think uh, maybe like but it's just, maybe what you can see from this so far is that we're working very hard and we think we're doing better. But even this very simple scenario is a very challenging one to get robust results with. Okay, what time is it? Uh, 55. 55. Okay, so I have 35 more minutes. Uh, <laughs> let me just, uh, I, would, I have more pretty pictures I want to show off. So let me tell you about something new uh, that I've been working on. Um, so uh, if we think about what the sort of the thermal history of our universe is, uh, you're all very familiar, I'm sure, with this uh, bicep 2 plot. Of course, we can reasonably say that between the end of inflation uh, and essentially BBM, that uh, we don't know what's going on. And so uh, typically, so maybe typically as defined by uh, if you install and run class and don't think too much about what happens before matter radiation equality, uh, you're assuming that your, your radiation dominated all the way up, uh, essentially, uh, since the end of inflation. There's no reason that has to be true. Uh, you could have a potentially long early matter dominated era uh, at some time after the end of inflation, so long as by temperatures about 10, ME, 10, excuse me, 10 MeV, you've returned to radiation domination. And that could be fun because there's all sorts of, well, there's all sorts of models that you can make work uh, and all sorts of interesting signal phenomenology associated uh, with sort of new, open, new windows for, for dark matter, uh, as well as small scale structure formation and so on associated with uh, an early matter domination. Okay, so one of the things, one of the games you can play with early matter domination is you would say, well, during an early matter domination, I have uh, matter density perturbations and those density perturbations are going to grow. Now, if I have the density perturbations that grow, I also have scalar, uh, scalar perturbations, so like scalar perturbations in the metric, those are going to grow, maybe to the point that they are not so, so tiny, that I could actually think about the second order uh, of production of tensor perturbations. And so uh, what I'm showing you here is a mechanism by which you have a, in an early matter domination, uh, I'm showing you as a function of scale as compared to the, the, the conformal time associated with matter radiation, early matter radiation equality, uh, how potentials evolve. And uh, so you have this potential uh, that once you get to the decay time, uh, it decays exponentially. And you can just interpret that as uh, whatever matter was sourced to the potential has now gone to radiation. Radiation doesn't cluster, and so that, that potential goes away. So there have been calculations of what the scalar, uh, or excuse me, what the tensor perturbations, or really the gravitational waves that you would get associated with an early matter domination would look like if you calculate them at second order in linear perturbation theory. It's not so linear. Now you have the quadratic combination of scalar perturbations, but it's just an interval. And so this has been something that uh, people who like, continue actually to argue about. What they find uh, the sort of the most up to date results is you take the omega gravitational wave, which is really defined as omega gravitational wave divided by 
uh, the uh, relative abundance of photons today, uh, per the uh, AS, the, the power spectrum amplitude parameter, AS squared, it looks like uh, about one. And so if you translate this into like what would be detectable at like a very a far future uh, observatory like Desigo, then you would need a uh, AS of about 10 to the minus five. Uh, that would, if, if you have AS of 10 to the minus five at the scales that are uh, within the horizon during an early matter domination, then you get some observable gravitational ifs. That feels like a lot of ifs, uh, but this is actually all linear perturbation theory. So if you have a really long uh, early matter dominated period, there's nothing stopping you uh, from going into the nonlinear regime. And so there was some uh, work uh, back in 2010 by Jadamzik and some of his collaborators that said, what happens if I undergo uh, nonlinear gravitational evolution? I form, uh, I form halos out of some unstable matter species, and then those halos are going to have to, uh, they're going to dissipate as the, the matter decays away into radiation. So the estimates here, um, presented in sort of more, uh, more human units, uh, d omega, d log f, uh, are saying you should get uh, contributions to the gravitational waves from three different sources. Uh, first, actually during the, the, the collapse, uh, the initial gravitational collapse of halos, that you get some gravitational waves from it. The second being that when you, uh, when you evaporate, when the matter decays, uh, that those potentials vanish, just like we were talking about in the linear theory, and that that, uh, that should give you some potentially very bright Right, doing a lot of work there, uh, signal, along with uh, the turbulent dynamics of the, the radiation fluid that's produced during the decays. And so this is, um, this is these are projections that are made uh, assuming uh, an AS of about 10 to the, of the normal AS, 10 to the minus nine roughly. And so this, the projections for if you have nonlinear uh, collapse and then evaporation in an early matter domination are much more optimistic than the, the, um, the ones that are uh, associated with the linear theory. So that seems like a good place to start. In fact, there have been some groups that uh, they tried to look at this. So this is coming from a simulation that just looked at the, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the collapse, uh, this, the gravitational waves that are formed from collapse. Spe so specifically, all of these simulations are happen happening during matter domination, and they are, uh, they are not capturing the details of either the turbulence or the evaporation, which are supposed to give you a signal that is something like seven orders of magnitude brighter than the collapse one. Now I look at uh, I look at these and I say, okay, actually, if I add seven orders of magnitude in uh, in energy density to all of those scenarios, uh, seems like I could and uh, and I, I I get to have something like a BBO or a Desigo uh, someday in the future. It seems like I should just be able to discover all of these, and uh, so that's very exciting. But of course, if you want to get the signal right, you should do the full evolution that has not just the collapse but also the return to uh, well, the, the evaporation and the return to radiation domination at early years. Yeah. Um, you, you'd also find lots of black holes, right? Pretty early on, if, the, if things are so nonlinear. Um, no, not necessarily. So uh, it's going to like. Like, curvature is getting to like order one. Like, AS is like order one instead of point one. So Good. So, so, so um, yeah. So, what's happening, right? Like, I, I think the answer to that is no. And so the reason I think the answer to that is no, is we are in a, a matter dominated era today and our black hole, our, our, our gravitationally collapsed dark matter halos uh, are not forming black holes, right? I have a, a, a cold, non-interacting fluid. I get halos that are certainly very dense compared to the background, but I don't make black holes out of them. Um, so another way, of, maybe sure. Yeah. I can check later, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let me just say that um, I don't want to take up too much of your time, and that we modify a uh, we take an n body simulation framework, we modify it so we have um, we have not just uh, dark matter, we have decaying dark matter, so particle dark matter that that clusters under its gravitational influence, uh, based on the location of that dark matter, it also uh, sources decay radiation. Uh, that decay radiation propagates under uh, gravitational influence and also its own fluid dynamics. And then uh, at the level of you already have an n-body plus fluid dynamic simulation going, it's actually quite easy to add your uh, second order metric perturbations uh, and uh, go and make a gravitational wave calculation. And so we do this. Um, so now uh, what I'm showing you is the gravitational, uh, or the metric perturbations that are uh, being sourced at the, around the time of decay. So once these halos really have started to evaporate in an appreciable way, 
Uh, and if you look, uh, you can see that there are some interesting uh, features here. So there's a, a particularly dense halo that was living right there. The halo had some uh, intrinsic uh, ellipticity to it, which meant that uh, its formation and its evaporation could produce uh, some gravitational waves. On the other hand, uh, we need to uh, simulate all the way until the time uh, that we've returned to radiation domination. And one of the, the reasons that this is really important, and it actually wasn't captured by previous simulations, uh, is if you think about what's happening with gravitational waves during a matter-dominant era, uh, yes, you can like cite the preheating literature, you can write down essentially wave equations with a source that looks like Tij, but you need to remember that during the matter domination period, Tij is always on. You're not evolving a free field. You need to be uh, uh, careful about how you calculate the energy density because you can have interference effects that say, all right, you had a really bright location here, but that uh, a really big source here, but that source basically stays on the whole time and until it smoothly turns off. And so the, to the degree that smoothly turns off, the source fills the whole universe with whatever value it wanted to push the field to. You don't get any time evolution associated that, with that beyond, um, uh, beyond sort of the intrinsic time scale for, uh, for the decay process. So doing this calculation, it turns out, with the return to radiation domination matters a lot, uh, because now by doing these simulations, we have something that resolves not just the, uh, the structure formation story, but also the evaporation and the turbulence story by merit of having that, uh, that propagating fluid in there. What we find is, um, <clears throat> so uh, what you should compare this to, uh, these are just showing you some power spectra. So saying we did one simulation where everything is very nonlinear, one, well, not everything, but at least many scales are very nonlinear. One simulation where things are, uh, are quite linear. So red is nonlinear, black is linear. So we can calculate the gravitational wave production uh, in these scenarios after returning to a, a radiation dominated era where there are no uh, meaningful uh, uh, gravitational wave sources. We can compare those. So it is true that you get uh, some small scale enhancement of power in your nonlinear scenario, but the peak of your power uh, comes at scales that correspond essentially to the horizon size at reheat. And that makes sense because the time scale of variation in this problem is the decay time. And so that's where the peak of the power is. And whether you're nonlinear or linear, you don't have a considerable enhancement of power, gravitational wave power on that scale, uh, which is something that you wouldn't have known until you did these simulations. This is really a question of like, there's a, there's a, a convolution uh, of the first order scalar perturbations that source the second order tensor perturbations. So there is a power transfer. It turns out the answer is that the power transfer down to the scales that, uh, that actually matter for the detectability, potential detectability of the signal uh, just are not very efficient. So it's a little bit of a bummer that this uh, turned out not to give a right, uh, bright signal like some of the other estimates had, uh, had found. But this is actually a statement just that uh, for calculating gravitational waves, what you want is you want big energy densities that are rapidly changing. And so it turns out that even in the nonlinear regime, that the uh, exp standard exponential decay is not a, a fast enough way to change your energy densities. So if you think about other scenarios where you could have early matter dominations, uh, like uh, where you have uh, primordial, then, that then transition to radiation domination. So if you have primordial black holes or cue balls, species that would, would decay away super exponentially, this gives you a way of transferring power uh, that, uh, well, just or in this case, transferring power from nonlinear scales to scales that may still be non, maybe nonlinear, but it's at least well within the horizon, uh, where you should hope that uh, that power transfer is more efficient. And I think um, given that the linear regime calculations for these uh, PDH and Q-ball stories seem to indicate a much, uh, much better uh, detectability prospects, it's also worth considering these uh, in the context of the nonlinear regime as well. So because I just want to tie this back to axions, like I, I really like, uh, I like things that I want, I want to find things that give you uh, high frequency gravitational waves. For the reason that the hot new thing now is turning your axion detector into a gravitational wave detector, which is like conceptually cool, but there are not many good, I don't, I think any good signal prospects for uh, how you would get uh, bright gravitational waves at those signals. Although I'm happy to be uh, corrected, and so I, I don't know, I just I want to. I want to figure out one that works. I was hopeful that this nonlinearity story uh, might uh, get you somewhere. The answer turns out to be no, but 
maybe maybe faster um, maybe faster decaying species could, could do something for you. All right, that's all I got. Thanks for letting me like uh, give you some truncated version of the new stuff. I haven't gotten to talk about this yet, so that was fun. Time and since Josh had a lot of questions, maybe we should have questions uh, afterwards. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, yeah, thanks, guys. Yeah, the question I want to ask is later. Yeah, I was going to have a meeting out for later. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah.